Uh, good morning, church. I uh, hope you're all well. Uh, so today's reading of the word comes from John 17, um, verse 20 to 23. And the title of the word is Jesus Prays for All Believers. That's the title of the word. So it reads, <coughs> my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them um, may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have gave me, that they may be one as we are, as we are one. I, I am I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Uh, this is the reading of God's word. Amen. There's something about today's theme that makes me just want to pause real quick. Look at it. Pray that all believers may be one. It's intentionally written that way because that's what the prayer is about. And I mean, I was playing with words this week. Prayer for unity, prayer for oneness, prayer for unity of the church. And I realized the essence of this prayer, listen, is a prayer that all believers may be one. It's not random. It comes from somewhere. And it is an implication of something. Let me show you two slides. The first one, it's a screenshot from the Bible Project map of the Gospel of John. I showed you the screenshot when we started the series because I said I'll be preaching for four weeks or we'll be preaching for four weeks from one chapter. This theme runs through the whole of Jesus' farewell discourse from chapter 14 to chapter 17 and through the prayer that we are currently studying. It can be summed up like this. The one God consists of the loving relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit, we are bound into this relationship. It is a profound truth of the gospel. So if there's a prayer that all me believers may be one, it is not random. It's because this is who we are, what we are invited into, and what our experience of relationship with God should be. Let me show you a different screenshot from the book of Ephesians. So this is the Apostle Paul writing to a church like this in Ephesus. Starting chapter 4, after the word, therefore, with this unbelievable proclamation that you are one. Why? Because we are one body who serves one Lord. We have one Holy Spirit, one faith, one baptism, and one God. And we are one even though we are a collection of really, 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 really infinite amount of small parts that make this one big unit. It is an implication of the gospel. In chapters 1 to 3 in Ephesians, Paul says, this is the good news. And in the beginning of chapter 4, he says, therefore, if this is true, now we should live like this. And the first thing you should know is that you are one. So a prayer that all believers may be one is of utmost importance. This is a headline, bold, caps, underlined. We should take note of this in this chapter. Now we're studying this prayer over four weeks because like I've said the previous two weeks, we hold the conviction that we struggle with prayerlessness at the moment, both individually and corporately. We seem to be praying really hard when there's an immediate need or crisis, and then it seems like our urgency for prayer and the content of our prayer fades as things so-called return to normal. And like we said the past two weeks, we can't do that with our breathing. We need to breathe always, otherwise we'll die. It should be the same with prayer. We can't just pray when we feel like we need to pray. Prayer needs to permeate our lives. And we said what we're going to do in the series is we will study how Jesus prayed and what Jesus prayed. And then we will ask ourselves the question, do we pray like this? And are our hearts aligned with the heart of Jesus? Because if it is, 
I'm telling you now that it will bring a revitalization to our commitment to and our understanding of prayer. We'll be committed to prayer in a way like we've never been, and we'll understand prayer in a more profound way than we did before. So let me show you this. This is the breakdown of what we've covered over the past two weeks. We've learned about praying to glorify the Son. We've learned about praying as an experience of eternal life. I put the verses down there for you as well. We've learned about praying to faithfully finish the work that was given to us. We've seen why Jesus prays for us and our own value in His eyes. We've learned about praying for protection. We've learned about praying for sanctification. Now, that's a lot of praying. Like that'll keep you busy. And that's the way it should be. Because this is the stuff that was the concern of our Lord. Practically. If I say now, okay, let's head into a time of prayer. This is what we're praying for. I promise you we'll be here until tonight, or at least until someone has to eat. And then we'll probably go past that. Because you can keep on praying for this until the day Jesus comes back. We should not make the mistake of saying, I don't quite know what to pray about. I said to Rudolf this morning that I didn't want to do a series in which we talk about spend five minutes in silence and then they spend five minutes praying for unbelievers and then spend five minutes reading scripture and then spend five minutes praying for your kids. Like, we could have done that. But this is the real stuff that Jesus prays for. And this should help us to pray aligned with His heart. So today, what you'll see is as Jesus prays for us, He gives us three M's that worked out well. The model of our unity, the motive of our unity, and the means of our unity. Okay? The model of our unity, the motive of our unity, and the means of our unity. And can I just say, I mean, I'm a teacher by gifting. I am also a Bible nerd by training. But I always give you this structure before I start my sermon. And then I say, you know what, if you want to make a note of this, please do. Or you can even take out your phone and take a photo. The reason why I do this is so that you can study this yourself once we are done with the service. Like, you can't only be listening to my Lesecho or Shiami sermons and think that's your Bible fix for the week. That's the reason why I gave you the whole chapter again now. Like, if you just take the previous slide and this one, and you sit down with John 17, your mind will be blown, and you will pray like you've never prayed before. So that's a gift from me to you, so that we can understand the Word of God a little bit better. Let me pray for us, and we'll jump right in. Lord Jesus, we hear you praying that all believers may be one. That is a huge statement, but it's headlines, and it's of utmost importance to us. And that's why, Lord Jesus, I pray now that you would enlighten our thoughts, that your Spirit would teach us what you want us to know this morning, and that you will lead us in this prayer, and as believers, that we may truly be one. Earlier, Meryl prayed for everything that is rivaling you for our attention. I declare now that you have no rival and you have no equal because forever you reign. So reign in our hearts and reign in our minds and reign in this place now as we open up your word. Amen. Let's look at the first one. Jesus gives us the model of our unity. Now, warning serious Bible nerd stuff going to happen now, okay? It's called a nerd alert. So I need you to focus now and to lean in. Let's look at verse 21. There's a highlight there. Just as you are in me and I am in you. That's the line we're focusing on now. That is the model for our unity, okay? Now I'm going to throw out a series of big words now, and then a quote. And hopefully, all the big words and the quote will make you go, Waff. Waff is not a real word, but if you want to spell it, it's W-H-A-F. This is a profound mystery of the being of God. Listen, there is a mutual indwelling of the persons of the Trinity. Okay? So the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. They were revealed in the Bible as Father, Son, and Spirit. 
Yet, we must not think of, three, of the three persons of the Trinity as three faces in a yearbook, right? Like if you put a photo of God, you're not going to say, so, this is the Father, and this is the Son, and this is the Spirit. There's a mutual indwelling between those three persons. The Father indwells the Son. The Son indwells the Spirit. The Spirit indwells the Father. And you can reverse the order in each of those pairs. Maybe, Rudolf, it'll be helpful if you just go to the next slide so that we can just at least see a drawn picture of what that might look like. Do you guys see all the lines connecting all the parties in that relationship? So we can think of each person of the Trinity as a mask, but it's the same being, okay? It's a really, really simple illustration, but think about it. Like, now, this is me speaking, but now I put on the mask of the Father, and then I take it off, and then I put on the mask of the Son, and then I take it off, and then I put on the mask of the Spirit. Three different masks, three different persons, but one being wearing all of them. Okay? Now, the Greek term to describe this eternal, mutual indwelling of the persons of the Trinity is... I'm going to say it with Afrikaans accent now, perichoresis. Probably if you want to say it in English, perichoresis. Or if you want to say it in Greek, perichoresis. Okay? Now, perichoresis means, listen, all three persons occupy the same divine space. In other words, we cannot see God without seeing all three persons at the same time. Look at it. One heart, but all three persons at the same time. The three persons of the Trinity are fully in one another, and each person of the Trinity is in full possession of the divine essence. I'm going to read one more line, and then I'm going to go there. They, I've never heard of this word, but through my study, I found it. It's an English word. It's called co-inhere. Co-inhere. Hmm? English, guys, what a gift. They go in here in such a way that the persons are always and forever with and in one another, yet without merging, blending, or confusion. Whew. To be sure, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. But what Perichoresis maintains is that you cannot have one person of the Trinity without having the other two. And you cannot have any person of the Trinity without having the fullness of God. One picture. Three persons. No way to split them. No way to untie them. No way to linearly describe the relationship between them. That's why I actually think this is a phenomenal drawing of the Trinity. Do you guys see it? So when we behold God, we see this whole picture. We cannot split it, and we cannot untie it. And we are invited to participate in this profound mystery. Okay, now, let's quote the church father here to help us. This is St. Augustine. Look how he describes the Trinity. Each are in each, and all in each, and each in all, and all are one. Hey? Now, Augustine didn't write English. He wrote Latin, but he spoke Greek and read the Hebrew Scriptures. What a mix. So to pen a line like this is phenomenal. Listen to it again. Each are in each, and all in each and each and all, and all are one. That's the God we serve. What a mystery. What a beaut. What a phenomenal invitation to participate in this. Now, okay. I'm going to use an illustration. It's not a perfect one, but it is a good one. And that is the illustration of people dancing together. Now, we are a transcultural church. How on earth am I supposed to find one photo that will resonate with all of you when it came to dancing? 
I pretty much spent 30 minutes trawling the interwebs and even the deep web, no, I'm joking, I wasn't in the deep web, <laughs> to look for a picture that I could put up that all of you will go, nice. It's impossible. Think about it. We want to reflect, embrace, and enjoy the diversity of our context. Dancing is one of those things that has got so much variety just among this group of people that I'm seeing. So I decided not to put up a picture. Okay, your pastor gave up. I'm weak. No, I'm joking. But I literally just, just gave up. So here's the definition of dancing as it was given to us by the animation film Wally. A series of movements involving two partners where speed and rhythm match harmoniously with music. Rikus, I saw you smiling now. Did I quote this on your wedding? I think I did. I think I did. Okay. A series of movements involving two partners where speed and rhythm match harmoniously with music. That's what dancing is. So two, moving as one. But the only way that you can move as one, listen, is if the one places the other in the center, and then the one that was just placed in the center places the other one in the center. That's how dancing works. So there's no single person in the center. It's about this movement of placing one another in the center the whole time. There's two beautiful words. It's intercommunion of persons, and it is reciprocal, that means we do this to each other, and the operation of a dance is inseparable. Those are two nice words to describe the essence of the Trinity. So, the two people, what they do is they do it to each other, it's reciprocal, and their operations, like what they do, is inseparable. Like if you dance with a partner, whatever dance you're thinking of now, you need to dance together. And also, you cannot dance alone as if you are dancing with someone. Because you will look really weird. And probably end up on someone's camera roll. And someone will share it on a family group. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can't windsurf, makowskit, soki, twinstuit, meabel skuif, right? The Afrikaans all two-step dance. I can't do that alone. It's going to look really weird. I need to do that with someone. But when I do it with someone, our communion needs to be reciprocal and our operations need to be inseparable. And the moment that loosens, then I step on Marie's toe and she goes, <laughs> I know what this is here. And then I go, love, I'm so sorry. Do you know what I mean? Then it goes pear-shaped. It's not the way it should be. Okay. How tight is the Trinity? Do you guys know that emoji? With the blush cheeks? That one. That's how tight the Trinity is. Now check this. Jesus prays that all of us may be one. Like that. That is mind-blowing. And let me just ask you two questions. Straight up. Do you experience this in any of your human relationships? Do you experience this oneness with any human being on this planet? Let me ask you a more difficult question. Do you have this experience with someone in your blood-bought family? Because this is our blood-bought family. This is my brothers and sisters. And we all serve the same father. So if this is my family... Do I actually experience this with someone here? And do you? Because that's the model. We can't make it less. We can't give any ifs and buts. That is the way it is. And that is something that we should strive for and pray for because Jesus Christ himself is praying for this. Jesus also gives us the motive of our unity. Look at the highlights, verse 21, and then also verses 23. That the world may believe that you have sent me, and that they may be brought to complete unity. That the world may believe that you have sent me, and that they may, may be brought to complete unity. Look, the motive of our unity is mission. So the reason Jesus prays 
for all believers to be one is for our mission. It is that we would have a credible witness. Think of John 3.16. God so loved uh, the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes, do we see the world in our hall? And do we see whoever Or do we disqualify people to be part of this church because we don't experience this oneness? The motive of our unity is is that we would have flesh and blood to our verbal witness. Because my verbal witness is that God loves everyone, that He created a new family, and that I'm now part of this family. But I need to show it in flesh and blood. If I say, brother and sister, to you, and I do not treat you like a brother and sister, then we have a problem here. Because then my witness is not credible. Then it's all lip service. It's all in here. As I was prepping for this sermon, I was thinking of the sermon that Murundeni preached with the simple title, One, in our Acts series. And he made exactly the same point. And in it he said, We allow family to interrupt our lives. Do we allow uh, church family or spiritual family or blood-bought family to also interrupt our lives? Because we should. So for our mission, this oneness is important. And what's important for me about this oneness is that we would have both horizontal and vertical diversity in this church because we want to reach everyone uh, in this area. So we often think about diversity horizontally, right? Racial, black, white, uh, colored, whatever uh, the rest of the categories might be. But we should also think about vertical diversity. From high income class to very, very low income class. And if you think of uh, of horizontal and vertical diversity and you put all of those people together and they can be one, then you've got a phenomenal witness. Because then it truly shows that God loves all people. It truly shows that God reconciles people. It truly shows that the grace of Christ changes our hearts and brings us together over these man-made boundaries. This oneness is important for our mission. Let me show you a picture. This is a symphony orchestra. A lot of musicians, a lot of instruments, one conductor, one sheet of music. Well, multiple sheets, but like one piece of music. Here's the thing. This orchestra, even though they are incredibly diverse, need to follow the single hand of the conductor. And they need to follow the sheet music as they are playing it. And they need to listen to the beat or to whoever drives the piece of music. Because if they don't, it will turn into one big mess. So in exactly the same way that this orchestra needs to work together to put on a great show, the church needs to work together to put on a credible witness to the world. Do you guys get me? That's why we have to be one. That's why we want to create pockets of fellowship. That's why we want people to know one another. That's why we get stuck into each other's lives and each other's mess. So that we can become one. Because if we do, we all play together. Just tuck that one away for our benediction at the end. So on the one hand, our motive for our unity is our mission. And then on the other hand, it is about perfection. The way something is intended, when you see it, you get a phenomenal feeling. Do you guys know that feeling? When you see or experience something and you feel like this is the way it should be. That's what we were made for. Like the church was called to be one. So this oneness will not only help us in our mission, this oneness will bring us to perfection. And how beautiful is perfection? That's what question of the day was all about. Just to think of how beautiful that ox tail is that you want to chow the bones. You had me at that one. Mm -mm -mm. I'm quite hungry now, to be honest. Redeemed men and women become perfected into one. The Greek word that is used in verse 23 is, it's a long one, teteleumenoi. And that means the job is done. In the Gospel of John, 
That term is used when it speaks about Jesus achieving his work, right? So it says, Jesus achieved his work, he achieved his work, he achieved his work, and then right at the end, it is now finished. There's nothing more to be done here. There's no improvements. This is it. The work is done. And then he prays. That we would be perfected, that we would be finished, that we would be in the way that we were created to be, and that way is one. Isn't that just a beautiful piece of gospel truth? So Jesus completed his work as the Savior of the world, chapter 19, verses 28 and 30, also carries this Greek word. He says it is completed. He says it is finished. And now his prayer, just before his crucifixion, is now God, you bring them to complete unity. That's what he prays for. That they might be brought to complete unity. Let's go back to the orchestra photo. So on the one hand, I said, if they want to put on a good show, they have to play together. And they have to be one. But then on the other hand, if they play together, perfectly it will move you absolutely whether you like classical music or not if you behold this diverse group of people being of one heart and one mind and one score of music it will move you the church should be one and in our oneness it should move people when they look at it so the motive for our unity is not only our mission, it is also we were created to be one. And before the sin of the world, there was perfect unity between God and Adam and Eve. And that little triangle had a really good vibe going. And that was God's plan for the whole creation. But it was broken by sin, and He's bringing us back into it, because He will not let sin have the last word. That's really important, the motive of our unity. Third point, and that'll be us for today, the means of our unity. So the highlight there is in verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, verse 22. Do you guys remember in week one, I made a lot about the spring box, so I thought I'll just remind you, you know, and maybe just show you that photo again. The first week, I put up this photo of the Springboks winning the William Webb Alice Cup in 2019, and I said, there's a presence among these gentlemen who played the game. Like, they are the real deal. They are the world champions. The scoreboard says so. They carry a vibe. There's a weight behind them. And there's a weight behind the badge they carry because that badge currently says this is the best team in the world. If you think of the Springbok national team, you think of players coming from different clubs and provinces and then they are united under the same badge, right? So you would have the South Sea Sharks play the Vodacom Bulls and you'll have guys pulling and tugging on each other's jerseys. But when they get into the Springbok dressing room, they put all of that aside because then they are united under one badge. And every single player who's ever had a post-match interview of their first game, you know, when they say, so how did you feel wearing the Springbok jersey for the first time today? Then they'll start with, yeah, no. And then they'll continue. And then they'll say, yeah, no, you know, when you put that jersey over your head, Something happens to you, and you realize that it's way bigger than you. You're playing for someone and something else. And then behind that badge comes your glory. Because if you've played a hundred test matches plus, or if you've played one, you are a springbok. You get the glory, and you get the honor, you get the tracksuit, you get the shirt, you get everything that comes with being a springbok. That's what Jesus says. I have a vibe. I have a character. I have a presence. And my character and my vibe and my presence is a loving one. It is a world-changing one. It draws people to me from the margins and from the center, the religious and the irreligious, the Pharisees and the sinners. I draw all people onto me as I am lifted up, and now I gave them that glory. 
Like Jesus gives us the ability to have that vibe and that presence in the world. We didn't win the World Cup, but He gave us the jersey. He won the World Cup, but now we live in that glory. Because whether you played in 2019 or not, if you're a Springbok currently and you walk through that door, I assume 75% of the all go, wow, because you carry the badge and it was given to you. You move under a specific name. We move under the name of Jesus. That is our presence and our vibe in this world. I want you to just take a peep here quickly at the word transcultural. Look at it, because the word one is tucked away in there. Rudolf, if I could just have our definitions on, please. A view of community, check, that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context. So the word diversity is in there. We want to be diverse. We are not blind to anything. We are open-eyed about everything that God has given us. And by the power of the gospel... We want to transcend it and create, there we go, one new community in Christ. We believe that God has called us to this place to have this presence. We believe that God has called us to this place to give off good vibes to this city and this town and this little microcosm that we're moving in. God brought us here because He wants people to see us, and when He sees us, He wants people to see something that is truly glorious. I often say to people, when they ask me about our church, how did it happen, and how's things going, and blah, 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 I listen to all their questions, and then I say to them, why don't you come? Just come one Sunday. A Sunday isn't everything in the life of our church, but it is a very important day in the life of our church. Just come. And then just come and feel it. And tell me if you feel something that is different. And I just want to warn you, it is going to mess with you. Because you are going to feel something that is different. And with that, I'm not saying that we have everything perfect. But we need to, we need to own this vibe that God has given us. We are His body. We are His bride. We are His family. We are His people. And in the way that we interact with one another... It should make people ask questions because what they see when we interact with one another should mess not only with their minds but also with their hearts. That's why Jesus prays that all believers will be one. He gives us the model for our unity, the motive of our unity, and the means of our unity. Now, church, I want to invite you. Let us pray that all believers may be one. From small, personally, and Fellowship City, to global. Because the truth of the Bible is that we should be one family consisting of 2.2 billion people who confess faith in Jesus Christ. What a united front. We can change the world by just being who God made us to be. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to gaze at the model you've given us and the profound mystery of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I want to pray that if that is something that is confusing us or something that we have not experienced yet or something that we are curious about, that you would work in our hearts and minds and, and in our spirits to grasp this profound mystery and beautiful invitation. You've given us the motive of our unity. Make us perfect. Complete us. Do with us as you please. So that we can show the world what glory looks like. Give us a credible witness, Lord Jesus. That when we say what we need to say about the good news, that we'll back it up in flesh and blood and in real life. Lastly, I pray, Lord Jesus, that that we as individuals and and we as Fellowship City, that we would have a vibe, that we would have a presence, that we would show your glory, the glory that you've given us. 
and that we will wear the badge that you've given us and that we will walk with confidence and walk in pride because of what you've done for us. May we treat one another in a way that shows the love that you've given to us, the love that we can still taste in our mouths. Make us one, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you.